my brief is uh, pretty straightforward. Sikhism from the Punjab to California. So I sat down yesterday and typed out uh, this statement. And uh, sort of the challenge was what to leave out um, 15 minutes. So there you go. Uh, so let's start with the, just the basic facts. The six represent one of the youngest and perhaps the least known of the world's monotheistic traditions. At present, these are the 2011 census. The community comprises around 25 million adherents, 20 million of whom live in the Punjab, a region in the northwest of India. And we were talking about the regions that is very significant. It's northwest and very close to Afghanistan and on the Silk Route. Three million have their homes in other parts of the Indian subcontinent. During the 20th century, two million or so six fanned out of the subcontinent to settle in countries across Asia, East Africa, Europe, and North America. This steady and significant migration has turned an erstwhile Punjabi ethnic group into a global community and the Sikh leadership is learning to work out its implications. The nature of relationship between Sikh beliefs and those of the Indic and the Near Eastern religious traditions has so far defied a scholarly consensus. In literature available in English, varied attempts have been made to situate Sikh beliefs in the larger Hindu fold, presenting them with an affinity to Islam and through it Christianity and Judaism and explaining them as an exercise in syncretism between the Hindu and Islamic beliefs. Instead of engaging with these scholarly positions, let me present to you some basic observations about Sikh beliefs and history, and then you yourself can locate the community in the larger layout of religious traditions that you know well. So as for the Sikhs are concerned, they believe that they follow a revelatory tradition. Ten Sikh leaders beginning with Nanak, his dates are 1469 to 1539, and ending with Gobind Singh, 1675 to 1708, that was the period of his leadership, shaped the destiny of the community in its formative phase. The poetic composition believed to manifest the revelation to the Sikhs are collected in the form of an anthology called the Granth, which literally means book. The text moved to the center of authority and became the Guru Granth book manifested as the Guru, the preceptor, after Gobind Singh's decision to discontinue the institution of personal leadership within the Sikh community. The contents of the Granth define the Sikh way of life, and its text provides the core to Sikh religious and ritual life. As a corollary of this status, Punjabi, the primary language of the Granth, and Gurmukhi, the script in which the compositions are inscribed, are assigned a sacred status too. So, the first detail that we need to remember then is that six are people of the book. The six also believe that the lives of the gurus were part of the revelation and Sikh history that followed them reflects the divine design. Sikh supplication recited at the close of congregational worship constitutes a straight record of the historical memories of the community from its founding to the present day. It expresses gratitude to God. The most frequently used Sikh term is Vaheguru, literally the wonderful sovereign, for showing the community the right path in the past and its closing six seek divine blessings in dealing with the current problems facing them. And what is the importance of that? That this divine design unfolded in the Punjab and they consider the region to be their sacred land. And they successfully created a mythology of being divinely ordained to rule it. Over time, 
they developed an elaborate sense of sacred geography around the spots associated with the activities of their early leaders and memories of what 18th century literature would say, sick blood spilt while fighting for sick sovereignty. By mid 18th century, the Sikhs successfully elevated themselves to be become the rulers of the Punjab, a position that they lost to the British in the 1840s. The need for the retrieval of Sikh sovereignty is engraved on the communal memory and this belief took different manifestations during the British rule and after the independence of the subcontinent. So there are people of the book with a very close relationship with the land of the Punjab. So moving on to their theological beliefs, the Sikhs constitute a monotheistic tradition, and this implies that they believe in the unity of God and all that comes with it. This omnipotent, omnipresent, transcendent sovereign brought the creation into being and became immanent within it. So they have their own imprint on what we associate with monotheism. As a result of the belief in divine immanence, the universe is a place of beauty, a lush green meadow where the lives of human beings unfold. God is fully involved in the day-to-day -day running of the world. The metaphors used are those of a farmer who prepares the field, sows the seed, and waits to see the bloom in human hearts. And the divine activity parallels that of a potter who shapes humans and other figures and enjoys watching the results of this activity in the world. So it's just they have their own imprint. And I remember a graduate student asking me, why wasn't Nanak worried about theodicy? I said, he lived in a beautiful world. He didn't come to Santa Barbara, but the world he lived in was as gorgeous as this. It's the foothill of the Himalayas. As for the humans, they must work on the assumption that the search for and the knowledge of truth are important, but living it out is the paramount goal. And I think there's the distinction is very clear. The belief in itself would not take you very far. That has to be translated in real action. The spiritual and the temporal aspects of life are thus closely interwoven in the Sikh belief system. For Sikhs, God is the only rightful object of human devotion and prayers, and this experience is expected to translate into activity that unfolds at individual, familial, communal, and social levels. At the personal level, it involves the cultivation of values such as compassion, contentment, duty, effort, humility, service, and the control of the instincts of anger, greed, attachment to the worldly goods, and pride. The cultivation of the individual self leads to a well-pronounced ethics of familial responsibility. A successful human being must work within the context of family and domestic responsibility. Um, and in this conception, Nanak created a significant space for women to establish themselves as useful members of the community and society. And just please remember, we are in the 16th century. Some of my friends would like to present Nanak as the first feminist, but that's really not the point here. Family ethics is further expanded to include one's obligation towards the good of the community, which implies a life of high social commitment. Religious life demands the qualities of hard work as well as sharing the fruit of one's labor with others. Though humility is a virtue, it must be dignified humility. A life without dignity is worse than death, as one must command the respect of others. Nanak's ideal human being is a productive and well-respected member of the community. Ultimately, Nanak believes that human beings are required to relate to the society at large, as well as the natural world around them as part of the divine creation. 
all people, irrespective of their color and features, are related and should have respect for each other and sensitivity towards nature in general. Building on this belief, his successors went on to institutionalize a community meal, dig wells to supply water, and supplicate for the welfare of all. The need to show kindness towards all went on to shape sick views of socio-political ecological ethics. Working on this, the Sikh came into clash with the local rulers and eventually reached the conclusion that they have to establish a kingdom of their own to bring divine justice on this earth. As part of this, Gobind Singh, the 10th personal guru, introduced a new ceremony of the nectar of the double-edged sword. sword. Undergoing the ceremony implies that the person is willing to make a special commitment, which in the contemporary context means following the Sikh way of life in a strict way. The Sikhs are to pray three times a day and keep five items. That's a sort of, they don't uh, cut their hair. The whole idea is that the body should remain the way it is. Um, the, and then the hair should be kept clean. Uh, and there the, this sort of, I'll give you the present day version of this. Everyone must carry a comb. And then they carry weaponry. The sword is uh, obligatory to carry. And then this is the bracelet. And originally they were part of the weaponry. This would protect the hand, the right hand, and the sword was 36 inches. But over time, these are the present day versions. Sikh enterprising spirit encouraged some of them to move outside the region. They had begun to settle down in major trading centers of the Mughal period by the end of the 16th century, and they continued to migrate to other places. The coming of the British to the Punjab in the mid-19th century created opportunities for travel overseas. The earliest, earliest reference to the landing of the Sikhs on the West Coast appears in the San Francisco Chronicle of April 6, 1899 effectively navigating their way through racial and legal discrimination, the sick numbers continued to rise and reach around 7,000 in the following decades. These people large, largely farmed in California. In 1920, report listed 85,000 acres uh, in Sacramento and San Joaquin and 30,000 in the Imperial Valley under their control. The phase of settlement was followed by a period of great difficulty, resulting in a decrease of Sikh presence. Some chose to go back to the Punjab, some died, and by the mid-1940s, only around 1,500 Sikhs were left in California. With the passage of Lou Seller Bill in 1946, the community began to slowly grow. The next 20 years raised the numbers to around 6,000 Sikhs. A major phase of expansion began with the Immigration Act of 1965. At present, the community comprises over 350,000. I think it's hard to get the right figures, but somewhere there, they would like to give half a million, even one million, but I have the feeling it's somewhere around 350,000. Both individually and collectively, the Sikhs have done well in this country. There are cases of outstanding achievements. Dilip Singh Sound uh, was a three-term congressman from the Imperial Valley. He was a Sikh. On the collective level, the Sikhs also tell a story of considerable success. Being a congregational tradition, the Sikhs built Sikh temples wherever they go. The first Sikh temple was built in Stockton. Uh, at that point, the hub of Sikh activity. I remember visiting the temple and the person with me, he was a professor of philosophy, asking me, why Stockton? And I took him around and I said, do you see something? He said, no. 
I said, don't you see the railway line? There it is. People could come from all over and meet twice a year. Um, it remained the only one built in the first half of the century. The second one came in the Imperial Valley in 1946 or 48, I think. Uh, as the community grew in the subsequent decades, so did the number of Sikh temples. There are over 20 in Southern California alone, and the number in the US has crossed 100. This means one Sikh temple roughly for every 400 some people. The Sikhs have contributed millions of dollars toward the construction of their places of worship and have created impressive structures, leaving a mark on the local landscape. When you cross the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, El Sabrantes Sikh temple stands at the top of the hill and symbolizes the community's pride in the area. I've sort of seen that several times, driving with the Sikh, and he's showing me, do you see it? And I said, yes, I do. And the institution of Sikh temple has always served both as the religious and communal center of the community, and it continues to perform that function in the US. The move overseas has begun to leave its imprint on Sikh religious and cultural life. We spoke about Sikh sacred language and script earlier. In the changed circumstances, the language used in congregational worship can no longer be Punjabi as the children don't read, speak, or understand it. Many Sikh temples use English to involve children in the worship service. The birth and marchery rituals have to be performed differently as the traditional ones can't work in the setting of hospitals and funeral homes. The festivals of Thanksgiving and New Year Eve have entered the Sikh calendar. Alongside the Sikh flag, the American flag is now used on cars, houses, or even Sikh temples. Time and the American environment, over time, the American environment is leaving its impact in interesting ways. Small group of people of Euro-American descent joined Sikhism in the 1970s. They took up this path under the spiritual guidance of Harpajan Singh Yogi, a Punjabi Sikh who came to California in 1968. Since the Sikhs have been primarily a non-proselytizing tradition since 1700, this is an interesting new development as we write, as I speak. The Sikh community is in the process of a transition from a regional Punjabi group into a world community as well as, as a world religion, and it faces interesting challenges and opportunities in the years ahead. The process of maintaining Sikh identity, explaining its contents to children, growing up away from the Punjab and the mainstream people in adopted lands is not simple. It provides an opportunity as well as a challenge to reflect on what constitutes core religious beliefs and practices shorn of Punjabi cultural patterns. The unfolding of this process marks the next phase of the crystallization of Sikh self-understanding. Thank you.